Hey guys, it's Tidi Kopantoa, and today I want to talk about how I do effective camera moves only using a 2D space, utilizing 2D techniques. Now, I personally think camera moves are just as important as good blocking, good shots, and compositions. So I do try to implement it as much as I can in my storyboards, in my animatics, in my 2D animation work. And in most cases, these are done in 2D. So I want to talk about how I go about making believable camera moves that have a bit of depth, that have a bit of motion, a bit of perspective, just ways that you can differentiate between, let's say, a zoom in, zoom out versus a truck in or a truck out. And some tips that I'd like to share in how I cheat certain things. The stuff that I'm going to show can be done in a lot of 2D animation programs or video editing programs. If your program allows you to move layers from one place to another and set keys to them, that's pretty much what I'm utilizing for a lot of these things. So with that being said, I keep three tips or three things in mind when I commit to these camera moves in a 2D animated space. The first one I want to talk about is literally moving what the audience can see. This is the most simplest way to do a camera move. The way this works is that you have a shot. Even let's say rotating the screen gives the impression that we're tilting the camera. Because of its simplicity, this is what I try to resort to in most of my shots. So imagine animating an elaborate fight scene in a big wide shot, but you want to punch in closer to track the characters doing the action. Well, you can animate your whole scene in one giant shot and enlarge that content around to simulate that camera move. I sometimes use this for camera shakes or little wiggles, or if I just wanted to have a camera drone through the scene so it doesn't always feel so static. Most apps and programs where you can do 2D animation allows you to pretty much move this camera. But let's say you don't have access to this camera, what you can do is animate or pose out everything in this one big mess shot and literally just scale that, rotate that, or move that thing around. Now the thing I love about this is that it's simple. The issue with this is that it doesn't really take account for depth. So let me give you an example. Let's say the contents of my shot is moving downward screen wise. Now, because it doesn't really take depth into consideration, you'll just see a flat image moving around the screen. And in some cases, it's going to be harder to describe if this is a shot that's literally tilting up, meaning the camera's facing upwards, or if the camera's actually going up and down elevation-wise. With those being said, it's kind of hard to distinguish between that if we're just dealing with a transformative pan. This then leads on to my next tip. The next one I want to talk about really sells like camera move, and this is the parallax. The parallax is an idea of things moving at different rates on screen to further sell depth within the camera move. So we kind of have to think about this in a background and foreground element. Our background is going to move slower spatially, whereas our foreground is going to be moving much faster, and they're both going to be moving in the same direction. This gives illusion that the thing that's slower, the background, is moving slower because it's further away from us, whereas the thing that's closer to us, the foreground, is moving much faster. Now, if we were to stylize the speed of these two layers, let's make the background element move much, much slower and the foreground element much closer to us, moving much faster. Now we're exaggerating the scale. Now this whole space feels much bigger than it is. You can have multiple layers, and a general rule that I keep in my mind is that everything that's further away, slower, everything that's closer to us, faster. But that's not all. We can also tease the idea of a rotation, or the camera rotating around the set or the scene. So we can have the foreground element moving in one direction, and the background element moving in the opposite direction. Now we're kind of giving the impression that the camera is rotating around the scene. Now the same can be said elevation wise, so we, we can have the background element moving downwards whereas the foreground element moves upwards. This kind of gives the impression that we were looking at a high angle, slowly leveling to the ground. To achieve something like this, it's a good idea to think of your horizon line. Each thing below or above the horizon line is going to move in the opposite direction from the other if you are to do a camera move like this. So just to remind you, the idea of the parallax is that the foreground and the background move at different rates to sell the illusion of depth during a camera move. So remember that example where we just had the drawing or the piece just pan up and down? Now if we actually separated the foreground and background movements, whereas the background is moving much slower than the foreground elements, now it feels like the camera is booming, meaning literally moving up and down, rather than just tilting upwards, meaning looking up while the camera stays in place. 
Here's another one with subtle differences. Now the foreground element is moving down, but the background elements are moving up, kind of giving an illusion that the camera is moving upwards, but it's also tilting downwards. Here's another example of the parallax. Background elements are moving in a different direction, whereas the foreground elements are moving in another. I pose out the character just a bit in the middle just to sell that illusion that the camera is rotating around them. Now let's utilize the first tip where we actually just move the master shot. So we're adding shakes, we're adding tilts. Now it just makes the thing feel a lot more chaotic, more intense, and more handheld. So when it comes to camera moves, I usually just resort to the first two tips moving around what can be seen by the audience, and implementing parallax. But there's another tip that I'd like to share that I rarely use because I usually don't need it and it does require a bit more planning and labor and because of that, I don't necessarily go out of my way to use it. If you really wanted to go with the extra mile of, let's say, teasing a little bit of depth, and 3D without using 3D, then the third tip that I would advise is to think about the perspective shift. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this one because I feel like there's just a lot of things to talk about it, but I'll give you the basic gist. It's when you're manipulating the angles of the drawing, distorting things a bit to give the illusion of perspective. It's also not a bad idea to utilize vanishing points. So the idea is you're basically just distorting parts of a drawing to make it match to a certain perspective or vanishing point. And the walls open up depending on where the camera is. So in this example, which is a one point perspective, I'm really only showing two sides, one with the wall facing directly towards us and the other are walls facing the side. But depending on the placement of these walls and the camera and the perspective, I shrink and distort some of these walls on the depth axis or the Z axis. And the more complicated it is, like let's say you're constantly shifting the vanishing points or you're dealing with more than one point perspective, it gets trickier to control. When I did this example of the building, I was using Storyboard Pro, which doesn't allow me to set keyframes for the motion of perspective. So all I did pretty much was just stretch and squash the walls visually. It's not perfect, but it does sell the point. Here's another example that I did in the same program, and I kind of had to cheat this one. What I did first was I animated the grid rotating, and then I put that grid rotating in a folder, and then I squished the layer with the rotating grid just so that it's slightly in perspective. And for the characters, I basically just keyed them and tried to match them to wherever they were standing on the grid. However, other apps will allow you to have a bit more freedom when it comes to these effects, like you can actually key the distortion and perspective settings. Apps like Toon Squid on the iPad or even Procreate Dreams allows you to do this. Again, it's just one of those things that you kind of have to play around and to figure it out, but I think it helps if you prepare your vanishing point and your horizon line just so that you know where some of these lines and angles fall into. So those are the three tips that I keep in mind when thinking about believable camera moves. The first one being transforming and positioning the screen or the frame or manipulating a master composition or master shot to the camera. The next one is the parallax, the usage of putting your background and foreground elements at different rates. And the third one being perspective shift, manipulating angles and walls to show an illusion of perspective. I think the overall advice I have when dealing with camera moves is to think about the most effective and simplest way to achieve it and to think if certain camera moves are necessary. And if you can be more selective and economic on camera moves, it just saves you a lot of time and energy. But I will also let you know that my preference when it comes to storyboarding and animating and filmmaking in general, I'm more economic and selective of what I choose to implement. So I hope this helps and I do want to revisit the topic of camera moves. So yeah, bye. Interested in learning hand-drawn animation or learning how to finish an animated shot from beginning to end? Have a look at the store where you'll find the complete introduction to 2D animation video course, tutorials, and other resources. Learn classical animation approaches, drawing, lectures, techniques, and other process videos. Visit the store through the link in the description below.